On behalf of Clemson University's Department of City Planning and Real Estate Development, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this lecture. Uh, it's the Charles E. Frazier Lecture Series, sponsored by the Master of Real Estate Development Program. Uh, I'd like to especially welcome the faculty, students, and staff, and the many friends and supporters that we have with us tonight. Uh, I'd also like to give a special thank you uh, to some folks I'd like to recognize, uh, starting with the members of CREW, uh, Commercial Real Estate Women, um, and that's the Greenville chapter. Uh, it's an honor to have CREW support, and I believe we have approximately 10 or 12 CREW members with us tonight. Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Uh, is Natasha here? A chance? I was going to kid her because she's in the paper now that she's conducting network, or excuse me, neighborhood negotiations with Realty Link on a development on Woodruff Road right now. So, uh, please tell her I talked about her. Um, I'd also like to recognize the Urban Land Institute members uh, that are with us and appreciate all the help you've given promoting this event. You all have members who please raise your hand. The students, that includes you too. Yeah. <laughs> Most everybody in here. Uh, I would also especially like to recognize our Advancement Board for Real Estate Development Directors. Okay. Uh, Russ, Nancy, um, of course Dave. Uh, you guys are great. Appreciate everything you do for the, for the students in our program. Uh, and uh, I especially want to have the students recognized and the faculty, Dr. Terry Ferris, who founded this lecture series, Dr. Ferris. All the students, please stand up. All rise. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was I was hoping is Laura Lawton Fraser here? She may be she may be joining us later. Um, her and her sister Wyman gave a remarkable uh, presentation three years ago, and uh, she may join us in a little while. She's planning to come here as well. Uh, so please tell her hello when she comes in. Uh, we're honor honoring the legacy of Charles Frazier, who dramatically affected uh, the economic viability of the state of South Carolina. Uh, his vision helped transform Hilton Head Island from a sparsely populated uh, sea island uh, into a master plan community and resort development that is closely followed by so many of the leaders in, in real estate today. Uh, Clemson University established the Fraser Endowment for Community Design and Human Ecology in 1992, which was funded by friends and supporters of Mr. Fraser. Uh, Mr. Fraser also visited with the students during his time. Dr. Ferris had him come up and talk to students in a class. Uh, that's an interesting story in itself, but he, he was very generous with his time. Um, so many of the individuals who were associated with Charles Frazier have continued on and they have formed their own legacy in the business. And these are, these are leaders like we have tonight with Tom Webb, our, our featured speaker. Um, and many of them have been guest speakers in the Frazier Lecture Series, so it's an honor to have one more tonight with Mr. Webb. Um, let me introduce Tom, Dave Chandler, who's going to introduce Tom. Um, and I'd like to personally thank Dave. Uh, Dave has uh, done so much for the program. Uh, he is a director on our advancement board. Uh, he's also been a big supporter of our program where he spent many hours, uh, very generous with his time, also meeting with students, helping them with, especially with their career strategies, their job search. He's hired interns in the past. Dave is the managing director of finance for Faison, uh, who is one of the leading real estate development and investment firms in the nation, okay? Um, Dave, Tom, and Faison have been very generous with their time, their resources, and their financial support of our program. I'd like to personally thank you for what you've done, okay? And with that, Dave, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce Tom. Thanks, Robert. I've been on the, uh, yeah. Been on the advancement board now for five or six years. Can everybody hear me? Uh, and it's been really good to get to know not only the alumni and the faculty, but get to get to know the students. And so I've gotten to know the students not only in Charlotte, but but really all over. And I'd like to continue that and offer that up to all students. If you 
coming to Charlotte, call me up, and lots of folks have interacted with me. Uh, our guest speaker tonight is Tom Webb, who also happens to be my boss and is CEO at Faison in Charlotte. Tom has over 35 years of experience in residential development. Uh, he grew up in a small North Carolina town and went to UNC Chapel Hill. He's a Tar Heel. And then he did his graduate work at Wharton in Pennsylvania. His first job after grad school was with Charles Frazier at Sea Pines. And what's amazed me is, is when you look at these folks, is the responsibility and the challenges that uh, the Frazier Group alumni had. Many weren't much older than students here in the, uh, in the group here today. They were in their 20s, early 30s doing all this work. Uh, and all of those lessons that they learned, they used throughout their careers. And you'll hear Tom talk about that. Uh, Tom also worked for First Carolina Investors in Charlotte in the residential and securities area. And then it was really at Crescent Resources in Charlotte where he worked on some of the leading master plan projects in the communities in the southeast. Uh, he's responsible for over $4 billion in home sales, $2 billion in home site sales. And if anybody gets into that work, that's a lot of, that's a lot of sales. I'll tell you that right now. Along the way, he developed over 20 golf courses and work with some of the leading golf course designers like Pete Dye, Nicholas Design, Greg Norman, Davis Love, all household names that folks would know in the golf course area. What you're going to hear about is a, is a career that's continually changed. It's had successes, successes and many challenges, but it's really focused on flexibility in a career and the financial realities that you're seeing in the classroom for financial and real estate development. Please welcome Tom Webb. Thanks, Dave. I have to begin. Uh, I'm a loyal ACC fan, except for an occasional lapse on Duke basketball. My father was a high school football coach. I'm a lifelong football fan. And I got to tell you, that game was one of the greatest games I've ever seen. The emotions up and down. And I almost touched the ceiling in my den when you scored that last touchdown. <laughs> and I'm a bit surprised that y'all haven't figured out how to get uh, Deshaun <coughs> A scholarship to the MBA program and having back for uh, one more fall. <laughs> you know, I'm really honored to give this lecture tonight, following in the footsteps of my good friends Peter Rommel, Jim Chafin, my first boss Ron Terwilliger, my hero Harry Frampton, my good friend and the source of a lot of my knowledge, Diana Pomar. And I don't want to try to lower your expectations. But Chafin and Terwilliger and Frampton were senior executives. I was an assistant treasurer. But I will tell you that in the time that I was at the company, the perspective of the assistant treasurer really got to be a great place to be, to understand the financial workings of the company and to learn the master plan community business. <clears throat> Tonight I want to really cover three topics. The first, and I'm going to have a bit of storytelling, and I'll mix in, I hope, some best practices and lessons learned, and I hope in the process to inspire you students. But the first is a story of the Sea Pines Company, <clears throat> founded by a remarkable genius, Charles Frazier. The company had great assets. We had an incredibly talented but young management team. <clears throat> but we also structured as what I would call a pure development company, which meant ultimately we lived and died by the continued sale of condos and land. That entity encountered the recession of 73 to 75, which I'll cover, and we lost. Next, I'm going to talk about the impact on my career, what I learned while I was there, primarily in the master plan community arena. And I'll touch on three developments. And part of that, I think you'll see, is the tremendous impact that Charles had with his ideals and his vision, the legal structure of planned communities, covenants and restrictions, and it's just had a tremendous impact throughout the Southeast and frankly the nation. Then finally, I'm going to give a few words of encouragement to, uh, <clears throat> to the MBA students. But let me back up just a second before I get started and talk about Charles, because without him, I'd have never been in real estate, we wouldn't be here tonight. He was intellectually the most intimidating person I've ever been around. He was also incredibly curious, and I've referred to him as the random idea, random idea generator. I mean, he was incredibly creative. The one that 
I keep laughing about over the years is he came up with the idea of bicycle golf. You'd ride your bike to the next place, hit a shot, get back on your bike and ride again. <coughs> Incredible ideas, but Charles needed people around him who could filter his ideas and then could implement them. Next, he was really a Pied Piper. When you think about how he was able to attract all those young people to, this remote, to these remote resort destinations to work, and they were a really diverse group. Um, safe to say virtually all of them were type A personalities. But in, in reality, you know, Charles attracted them, he stimulated everybody, but one of the things that happened when we were there, we fed off of each other, and frankly, many of us have remained good friends to this day. And last, uh, really reiterating what I said earlier, I don't think the industry uh, and the people in the residential development business really realize the impact that Charles's overall master plan community concepts have had on us in the southeast and the nation. <clears throat> now, how did I get to Sea Pines? As Dave said, I grew up in a small textile town in North Carolina, <clears throat> went to Chapel Hill. I was actually the starting center on the freshman football team, majored in history and economics, thought I'd go to law school, chickened out my senior year, got a summer internship, which led to a full year's <clears throat> internship with Duke Power. I actually delivered the payroll to the Oconee nuclear plant when it was under construction down on Lake Oconee. I was the bag man for the chief financial officer, and that gave me some really good exposure to Wall Street, securities underwriting. I saw the financial world, I saw the legal world, and what I figured out is I belonged in the financial world. I did not belong in the legalese world. <clears throat> so after a year there, I headed off to, to Wharton to business school. Uh, the summer between years, I had an internship at B of A predecessor, NCNB. And that was a great place to be. NCNB had the second highest PE in the country then. The national division, which was the place to be, was headed by a young ex-Marine named Hugh McCall. And I really thought that that's where I was going to end up. But that summer, two of my friends, one was the uh, past president of my fraternity house, another was a high school classmate who had gone to Harvard, <clears throat> they had joined the Sea Pines Company, and they started talking to me about it. In fact, my high school classmate, he was actually in the, quote, office of the president. And so uh, that following February, I came down to uh, Savannah over to Hilton Head to interview. And that night I was met by the chief financial officer, Ron Terwilliger, a really impressive, athletic, uh, Naval Academy grad, and then as now, Ron was really compelling, particularly when he described to me the opportunity that Sea Pines would afford me. He also talked about uh, my job, which was, quote, cash management and cash flow projections. I was staying at the Hilton Head Inn, and I went back to the inn that night, and I took a walk on the beach. And I said, you know, all of my life, I've done things in a very predictable way predictable manner, and it's highly probable that I should go to work for NCNB, not far from the town I grew up in. But you know, I'm 25 years old, I'm still getting blind dates, I can take a risk. So on that walk, I decided that I was going to come to Sea Pines, and you know, I don't know if there's a message there about taking risk, but I will tell you, I don't like to reflect on what my life might have been as a commercial banker. So in June of 73, I joined 30-some MBAs who came to work with Charles at Sea Pines. Uh, my office was actually in Mary Fraser's uh, old Montessori school, and that's where the, some of the corporate finance players and the Hilton Head Plantation and Sea Pines Plantation finance team were located. And they were reading loan documents, processing loan draws, uh, loan draws trying to borrow money. That summer, though, I developed a real understanding of what the company was about, and I, I now call it a pure development company, and I'll elaborate. <clears throat> Lot prices historically had gone up annually in a pretty dramatic fashion for several years. Oceanfront prices, they kept bumping them up. They'd get Landauer to appraise them, and that would really be the basis or the equity for the company. The company had gone public, but it really didn't have any money really any liquid assets sitting in the bank. Uh, but that perceived value or appraised value <clears throat> was the basis on which the company borrowed. And 
as the, the work that you're doing today and you're seeing these cap stacks and you know, 20, 30, 40% equity going into multifamily deals, we didn't put any money. This was all 100% borrowing. We burnt 100% of cost of these developments. And furthermore, we were borrowing at floating rate prime, which was, I think, around 7% at that point. And then from a structure standpoint, the borrowing was done at the subsidiary levels and of the various projects, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the parent company was guaranteeing all of that debt, thus cross-collateralizing everything. So if one project got in trouble, they could come after the mothership at Hilton Head. Then from an operating standpoint, we had a, a really good cash flow machine Sea Pines Resort, it was grossing about $30 million. The problem was none of that $30 million was making it to the bottom line. <clears throat> so when, as I said, you looked at the cash in the company, we didn't have a whole lot of cash. And I'll give you one example. <clears throat> I'd gotten there in June, Labor Day weekend comes around. Uh, Mary Ferguson, who was our real cash manager person, she came and knocked on my door and said, Tom, we don't have enough cash to cover payroll. Well, what I realized is I was the highest ranking person on the island. Everybody had left for Labor Day weekend. Fortunately, we had closed uh, an ex expansion of the development loan for the big project in Puerto Rico, Palmas del Mar, from 15 million to 64 million. It had closed the middle of that week. We were able to draw what was referred to as a parent company allocation, and we released payroll. But from the big picture, what I figured out is we were a company that was a pure development company. We were, our success and failure was tied totally to our ability to continuously develop and sell lots and condos. Now, <clears throat> you guys are good at Argus and Excel. That fall, we set about to develop a computer model uh, to do life of project cash flows. And Harry Frampton had gone up to Richmond, Virginia to launch the Brander Mill project. And that was going to be our model. And we had a, a, a brilliant guy, later got a PhD in econometrics. He was our programmer. And we wrote this program from land acquisition all the way through resort ops, eight programs, 2,000 lines each. And, uh, but while we were doing that, interestingly, Sea Pines had commissioned a study. Uh, they had gotten Equitable lined up to be the, the financial partner for the Brander Mill project. And the study was about the feasibility of master plan communities. And they went through and questioned everybody in the company and they identified all these risks, environmental risks, political risk, entitlement risk, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and not the least of which you were in the housing business and housing's always followed by that noun cycle. I read that $100,000 study and I said, you know, you will never comprehend the risks that you're undertaking in these long-term master plan communities. But, you know, we were in the business. So <clears throat> I then spent the rest of that fall going around to see the various projects and gather the data for inputting into uh, this financial model, long-term financial model. I, I hit Amelia Island Plantation, uh, Hilton Head Plantation, which was at the north end of uh, Hilton Head, uh, River Hills in Charlotte, uh, <clears throat> then uh, let's see, we had Point South, but the most significant one was this project, Palmas Del Mar. <clears throat> Charles had wanted to get into uh, a revenue stream, resort revenue stream to cover the winter, and he wanted a, an island or Caribbean project to match the summer revenues of sea pines. And so <clears throat> this was the big project he found, a couple miles of stunning sandy beach, than a natural harbor area. It was several times the scale of Harbor Town. And then further up, there was a rocky promontory. Well, <clears throat> gathered all the data and got back to Hilton Head. And it came time to put the data into the model. We were also trying to get home for Christmas. This model bombed. And we kept saying to our brilliant programmer, what is going on? Well, finally, he figured it out. Total revenue only allowed for nine digits. Palmas was gonna gross over a billion dollars. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, there were a lot of cultural issues with doing business in Puerto Rico, and then that project 
also hit the recession of 73 to 75, and there was a write down approximating $100 million on Palmas. <clears throat> but while I'm gathering the data for the life of project cash flows, we were also doing the annual cash flow for the year that would begin March 1st, uh, 1974. We were on a 228 calendar year. And uh, you know, some of the numbers I'm gonna give you tonight may not be absolutely factual, but these numbers are not alternative facts either. <clears throat> Our gross revenues that year, I'm pretty sure, were $106 million condo and land sales. Based on that, we were to, quote, break even from a cash flow standpoint. I remember being in a bank meeting early that year when one shrewd banker says, well, what happens if sales are 70 million? Got blank stares from us. Well, now let me tell you about what I call the first black swan event of my career. In October, actually October 3rd, 1973, Egypt and Syria invaded the Israelis to take back land that they had lost in the 67 war. Uh, it only took until like October 20th to get a ceasefire. The U.S. though clearly sided with Israel, resupplied the Israelis. The Saudis and the Arabs, uh, they got really perturbed and OPEC adopted an oil embargo. All of a sudden, the prices, I think they almost quadrupled gas prices. There were long lines in all the gas stations. We lowered the speed limit to 55 miles an hour throughout the country. Charles was incredibly creative. His rationale was people are going to fly rather than drive to our resort. They're not going to stay a week since they've flown. They're going to stay two weeks. And what we've got to do is provide them electric cars when they get here. Well... In reality, the recession, and most of the times, you know, the people who report recessions are usually six months late. It actually uh, was determined to have begun in November of 73. The impact on the Sea Pines Company and our sales was just devastating. Uh, as I like to say, proverbially, the music stopped. By late spring, we had lowered our budget down from 106 to 65 million. By late summer, we had lowered it down to the high 30s, and we were essentially out of cash. So the, the first Tuesday after Labor Day, 1974, we began a process that I would refer to as a bankruptcy without a judge. And the trustee was a young NCNB banker named Buddy Kemp, who was absolutely brilliant. If he had lived, he, had, he was stricken by a brain tumor. If he had lived, you'd have never heard of a guy named Ken Lewis. But he was the de facto trustee, and we had a series of meetings with the lenders, culminated with uh, a meeting a couple months later in the basement of the relatively new Hyatt Regency Hotel in Atlanta. Uh, there was a Red Cross blood bank going on next door, I'll never forget it. But uh, <clears throat> the, everybody who had over 1% of the liabilities of the company were invited to that meeting to participate in our request for a $4 million line of credit, which was to get us to 1975 when we sort of thought the music would begin again. We got agreement. There were two main tenants. Any lender, collateralized lender who wanted to, could take title of their collateral. But all the lenders had to agree that they would not pursue the parent company guarantee so the parent company would stay in existence. We had one bank that balked took a couple calls from some vice chairman of two of the largest banks in the country, and the whole deal got agreed to. The end of that process is we finished the year 228-1975 with $29 million in sales. Hilton Head Plantation, we sold four lots. Wasn't enough to cover one month's interest on their development loan. So in essence, the, the line of credit, et cetera, proved to be just a Band-Aid. In March of 75, I got the, the banks forced a management change at a Amelia Island Company, which is a stunning development. And so I went down there. And after the first weekend I was there, though, it was kind of ominous and foreboding. The headlines in the Jacksonville Times Union, 50,000 unsold condominiums in the state of Florida. Now, Amelia is a really stunning piece of property, and Sea Pines, the, the planning concepts that were used at Amelia really took from what they had learned at Hilton Head. 
the ocean front sides got just a vast wide beach, 50 foot primary dunes, and they really concentrated the resort core, the resort rental condos and the hotel on the ocean side. <clears throat> the island is bisected by Highway A1A going through. The west side was more <clears throat> single family, retirement uh, oriented, and it had great long views over the marsh and the waterway back there. Wonderful harbor town like Pete Dye Golf Course. <clears throat> and, but by the time I got to Amelia, really, the, we had closed all the condos. We were simply operating a resort and we were operating in a deficit. Now uniquely, <clears throat> Sea Pines did not operate Amelia, Marriott did. And you say, why did Marriott operate? Well, when Sea Pines was, was getting ready to operate Palmas del Mar in this Spanish speaking environment, they went to Marriott and said, we need help, will you come run Palmas del Mar? Marriott said, yes, we'll do it, but oh, by the way, in return, we want to operate the E. Island plantation. So that's how they got our property. I spent uh, a lot of my time then in what uh, I'll call cash management and being bashed by creditors. Now, if you look here, cover payroll. You add the cash up there, it's about 16, uh, and that's not million today, guys, that's thousands. And it didn't cover the accrued payroll down here. Uh, I can give you, I could regale you for a good while with creditor stories, but I vividly remember having the Barnett Bank on one phone, Southern Bell on the other phone, and Southern Bell saying, tell the bank they have to guarantee our bill or this conversation's not going to go on much longer. Well, the most interesting thing, though, about Amelia's financial side <clears throat> was what I call a convoluted liability side. We didn't have a lender group that was aligned with us as a financial partner for the success of the project. We had a very diverse group. Each of them had their own collateral. So when it came time to figure out, well, who's going to fund to keep the lights on at this place? <clears throat> we had a purchase money mortgage, Union Carbide. They didn't care because they had a senior position on the south end of the island. They were in great shape. We had a land development loan with a struggling REIT. And we would tell them, well, you guys have to fund because if you don't fund, they're not going to sell any more lots and you're never going to get any pay down on your loan. Then we had the condo construction guys in CNB. If you don't fund, we're not going to sell any more condos. You'll never get paid. Then we had the permanent loans from Freedom Federal Savings in Tampa, Florida. If you guys don't fund, people are going to actually stop making their mortgage payments if the inn and the golf course close. <clears throat> Retail and office was a, a read in Jacksonville. If you don't fund, obviously, you know, the retail fails. And then Barnett Winston and Equity Trust, they actually had the golf course in the end, and we said, if you don't fund, you're really in trouble. Well, and then last, it didn't matter, First National Bank of Atlanta, they didn't have any collateral. They were behind Union Carbide. <clears throat> but this group really kept us afloat for about a year while I was there. But the issue they always wanted us to figure out how to scale and minimize the operating deficit. But with the Marriott contract, we couldn't do that. They had control of the operations. So again, on a uh, Tuesday after Labor Day, this time, 1976, this was not a bankruptcy without a judge. This was a bankruptcy with a judge. So at 28 years old, I go into Jacksonville and we file bankruptcy in federal court for the Me Island Company. About three weeks later, I vividly remember being on the stand in Jacksonville testifying to the assets and liabilities of the Me Island Company. Uh, <clears throat> we wrote a plan that fall. Uh, Doug Richardson, who some of you may know here from Clemson Days, was uh, the project manager and a lawyer in Jacksonville and I, and we filed that plan in uh, early January. Now. Let me just summarize what I've told you about Sea Pines and the Me Island Company. Again, despite the genius founder, the great assets, the remarkable management team, being in this second home discretionary product market, when the music stops, if you don't have another source of cash flow, it's game over. And that's eventually, I mean, that's in essence what happened to us. The takeaways for me were twofold. One, I got a great education 
uh, in the master plan community business and understanding uh, all of the attributes of the, the covenants and restrictions and a, their application and how you use those to drive an outcome in development. And then secondarily, I think being at Sea Pines, there was another thing that I really began to appreciate, which was working with great sites and being environmentally sensitive, because that was not the topic. Environmental sensitivity is not the topic that it is today. <clears throat> and then, I, I, you know, it's safe to say, I'd gotten a lifetime's worth of education in the bankruptcy process. But most importantly, I really knew about what true equity meant, what staying power meant, what reliable operational cash flows. I can summarize, I didn't ever want to get in a situation where I would be wor worrying about covering payroll again. Now what I didn't know at the time, or certainly didn't perceive, uh, the markets would start to get a little bit better and with the exception of the Gulf War invasion of 1990, uh, I think that was August of 90 leading into early 91, the residential markets over the next 30 years would be pretty strong and continue to improve and it would be prime to be able to do large scale master plan communities. I didn't, that was not in my thought process, nobody had that vision at that point. But in essence, it was time to make hay. NCNB had made me aware of a job opportunity in Charlotte. It was a small bank-sponsored REIT that had converted to an operating company. So <clears throat> 40 years ago, last month, I came to, uh, to Charlotte. I'd been there three weeks. The guy that hired me left, which was good for both of us. Uh, six months later, I was in essence running the company. Two years later, we had liquidated some good REO. We had some loans that paid off. We had some capital. We were ready to get back into the business, into business, but we didn't really have a business plan. I was approached by a fellow named Dick Cannon, and Dick had been another Sea Pines connection. The banks had put him in as the chief financial officer when they made the $4 million line of credit in 74. Dick had previously been president of Cousins Properties, actually did some development here in Greenville. Uh, he had a site tied up in, in Charlotte. And it was a large piece of land, and our company formed a joint venture with Dick to develop a community that became known as Park Crossing. And I want to cover this for, for two reasons. And the first is this deal probably had the best characteristics, the best metrics of any deal that I ever did. First of all, it was using other people's money. Now, Dick was using our money, which was really good for him. We were using the seller's money. That was back before you had to write a big check and you know, borrow money to acquire land. I think on a 630 acres, 5,000 bucks an acre, we made a 20% down payment, got great financing on that. It was a large track, large enough, what I call a critical mass, that if we worked on a piece of this land, we could create value for the land that we would hold in the future. Then this, we were in a receptive government jurisdiction as far as entitlements were concerned, and we came in with a comprehensive master plan uh, there was adequate infrastructure, water and sewer were there. Uh, we had to give some right of way for roads, but that was it. And most importantly, we got a wonderful zoning. Uh, multifamily for rent, multifamily for sale, some retail. Shortly after closing, we sold the multifamily for rent. Uh, about a year and a half later, a company called Mulvaney Builders, you might recognize that, his son was on CNBC in this morning. He's the head of the Office of Managing Budget. He bought the, the condo land from us. Three years into the deal, we sold 31 acres of commercial land for more than we paid for the entire 631 acres. So all that is to say, entitling land oftentimes is a better way to make money than developing land. But the great thing for me was we kept the single family component, which turned out to be 535 lots. And it was my first opportunity to really apply what I had learned at Sea Pines. And we did this master plan community <coughs> called Park Crossing. And I'm gonna show you some characteristics, the covenants and restrictions, architectural guidelines, builder guidelines, and they're really terribly simple. I'm almost embarrassed to show up. But we've put in, you gotta have a certain roof pitch, treatment over the windows, you know, jack arches, solder course, uh, tented and curved driveways, no straight in white driveways. Dormers had to look good, they couldn't look like dog houses. No brown brick, tree save, we didn't allow front entry garages. 
And, but, and very importantly, we didn't have a minimum house size because what I'd learned in the business, it's not the small house that can really screw up the look and feel of a subdivision. It's the house that overbuilds the neighborhood. Now, the end result of this process was over uh, about a five year period, our single family lot prices in this community went up two and a half times. And we started when uh, Prime was about 20%, but from 81 through about 87, things were great. And we went 959, 103, 159 lots. It was terrific. Uh, and we only sold to builders. And I, you know, I take a lot of pride today, about once or twice a year, I just ride out and ride through this community and see the street trees we planted. If you fly into Charlotte from the <clears throat> southern approach today and you look down, in the summertime, you can barely tell that there's a community there because of the tree save. And it's, you know, it's held its value incredibly well. About three or four years later, I did my first golf course community. Uh, and one of the key lessons I learned from Sea Pines is don't get stuck in an operating deficit. And so in the structure of that club, I separated real estate and the club, which is a little bit atypical, but there hadn't been a country club in Charlotte in almost 20 years. And so we said, come join our club. It's gonna be a member-owned club, $10,000 initiation fee. We opened with 300 members. We never had an operating deficit, and actually it never impeded our real estate sales in terms of having enough memberships to sell with the real estate. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing there was 90 days after we opened the golf course, there was an event called Hurricane Hugo. And believe me, that, that's a story for another night. Uh, <clears throat> then next came um, my career with Crescent. And I joined Crescent in the summer of 1997 and they really enticed me with, uh, they were getting ready to do a new development on Lake Norman. It was the last great piece of land that they owned on Lake Norman and they gave me the pro forma. And the pro forma was about a thousand lots at an average price of $200,000. I'd never sold a lot for $200,000. Crescent had also been developing, we'd done the Peninsula Club at 35,000 square feet in the clubhouse, uh, Ballantyne Country Club in Charlotte, had grown to 42,000 with a 15,000 square foot family activity center. We were finishing Sugarloaf Country Club in Atlanta, which was to host the Bell South Classic, the tour event. It was 70,000 feet. And I was a little uncomfortable. I never really liked big clubhouses. Uh, and in particular, I, uh, I thought they were cold during the daytime and they might pick up a little character at night. Well. This was a great site. We had fingers jutting out into Lake Norman, and we had about a 20-acre campus uh, defined for the clubhouse area. And so I hit upon this concept. Andrew Struani's traditional neighborhood development for you architects was, <clears throat> that was really in vogue at the time, but we didn't have any retail zoning. And I said, well, maybe we should take the club and blow it up into elements of a village. And then I said, how about a Nantucket village? But, or, but what I realized was that the members on our team, our wonderful architect, land planner, I think one person in the group, we had the great Norman architects, golf course players there, only one person really knew, had been to Nantucket. So I took a page out of Charles's book, and he had, uh, in 1972, I think he, before I got to see Pines, he flew everybody in the company out to California and showed them all these resorts. It was quite, the, they called it the Sea Pines Academy. Well, <clears throat> I went to my boss and I got one of the Duke jets and on a Sunday morning in February, we flew to Nantucket. And we spent the two, a day and a half up there and we looked, took pictures of everything from the granite curves, the gold leaf signs, the fences, the picket detail, I mean, uh, the ballast in the streets, the consistent architecture there. We went out to Sconset, the sundial, Came back home and we had a, you know, just a great time creating. Oh, these, excuse me, these are the houses at Park Crossing. I'm slipped up. Okay. This was the outcome. Uh, we had a barn look that became cart storage. We had the tavern at Scones that became our casual dining. That's the town center meeting hall. That was our formal gathering place. We had a coffee and cone place. It worked incredibly well. 
Uh, we actually incented architects to design Nantucket style houses and the real estate did really well. I think we sold three years in a row, we sold over 100 houses as an average over a million dollars with a Mooresville, North Carolina address. Now, you want a validation for a project? 2012, what was known as the Point Lake and Golf Club, it's now Trump National. <laughs> but to me, there's a message here that uh, is pretty much indicative of our, of our industry. There are no patents in real estate. Now, developers might be secretive while they're fighting over sites, but once they got a project or once they finish it, they want to show it to everybody. In my career, I've had one developer refuse to let me come show my team his project, just one. And you know, there's a, just a great opportunity to go see stuff. You know, you can really copy it. You know, like a guy like me who can become a developer, I didn't need to be an artist. I could go see the stuff and say, I like that, that's great. And that's what we did going to Nantucket. We saw this stuff, we replicated it, and it worked incredibly well. And I think that's also the essence of the Urban Land Institute. You know, it's all about sharing practices, uh, working together to create better, place, better places, the built environment, and the communities we live in. And it shouldn't be lost on us that the uh, <clears throat> ULI has the Charles Frazier Endowed Chair for Sustainable Development. And also, several of my peers uh, in ULI have been very active in the senior leadership. In fact, four CPINES former employees have chaired C uh, ULI nationally, and that's a two-year stint. And I, I was looking this way. I don't know how many of you raise your hands, but if you're not in ULI, please get involved. It's a wonderful organization, and the industry, I think, is very unique in its ability to share uh, not only projects, but best practices. Now, Palmetto Bluff. 20,600 acres. Uh, about 15,000 of that's high ground. About 8,000, a little over 8,000 could be developed. It's entitled for 5,000 units. The edge of the property is a stunning maritime forest, live oaks, magnolias. They're wetland sloughs that cut back up into the property. About 35 miles of water frontage. The marsh is actually very dynamic. The tidal change is six to eight feet a day and it's just gorgeous. I mean, it changes all the time. Property has a magical history. In fact, uh, at Crescent, we commissioned Charles Frazier to go to New York and study the history of the property. And it went from the rice plantations of the 1700s to the Wilson House Mansion, which you'll see the ruins in a minute, uh, that burned in the 20s. How did we get this deal? It's, it's a long saga. Jack Nicholas's senior design guy lived in Shreveport, Louisiana. The people who put Palmetto Bluff under contract were timber people from Shreveport. It was kind of like the dog that caught the bus. They didn't know it, but they were besieged by all these developers. I'd actually been driving to Palmetto Bluff for a due diligence trip and got a call and said, it's already under contract. We got a $100 million asking price. We got a $3 million non-refundable deposit. You don't need to come. My boss teared up, he almost fired me, but a couple months later we get a call and the timber people had talked to Jack Nichols, the design guy. He had called home base in Jupiter, Florida, and they had said, look, we're out of the development business. Uh, all we want to do is design the golf course, but we know who to call. They called us, we flew to Palmetto Bluff, met them, put them in a plane, brought them back to Charlotte, showed them the point. A week later we spent a a full day negotiating in Shreveport, Louisiana, and we shook hands, and we, in essence, took over their contract. About six weeks later, we went to the full Duke board, Duke Energy at the time, and got a capital commitment of a little over $300 million to develop Palmetto Bluff. Now, it wasn't like we didn't have a talented development team at Crescent, but my groups were mainly focused on primary housing uh, small custom builder uh, programs. We really didn't have resort experience. And clearly, Palmetto Bluff 
was going to be uh, at least more of a retirement second home deal and in all likelihood was going to include a resort component. Uh, so I got to assemble the management team. Well, guess what? It's the pros from Dover. The top four guys at Palmetto Bluff were all XC Pines guys. Uh, one was, uh, some of you may know, Andrew Bays and his father Tommy had been the marketing guy at Palmas. He was, I mean, he'd been the heart and soul of Jim Chafin and Jim Light's operation. Another guy had been the sales manager at Sea Pines, but all of them had had illustrious careers and uh, 20 years plus after leaving Sea Pines. They were led by <clears throat> a uniquely talented uh, landscape uh, architect, land planner, Georgia Tech, and, uh, <clears throat> named Jim Mosley. And one thing about Jim, he'd actually been in the office of the president in 1975 at, at Hilton Head with Charles. Uh, and we, uh, you know, what we knew was that this was a piece of property that was special. I had a good feeling about what the property should not be, which was another gated, low country, golf course driven retirement community. <clears throat> I had images of what I thought the place should look and feel like. And so I shared these with Jim. And you know, you see there's no glit, no water fountains, no marble entrances. It's really working with what is there. That's so you can really see those things. But oyster shells, open ditches, birdhouses, you know, active place, but we really wanted to get people out to the edge and enjoy the nature that's there. So as we begun uh, the planning process there, you know, as I said, we were working with, with, with something special. And I don't think it was probably that dissimilar from what Charles, when, when they first started working at the south end of uh, Hilton Head, turning that into to Sea Pines Plantation. But uh, the word that came up to me, and we kept going through these you know, planning charrettes, et cetera, but the term that ended up sort of dictating everything we did was subordinate to nature. Now, if you're doing urban development, it really is about the architects and the planners and the buildings that they build. But when you're working with a great environmental sites, it's really different. And what we were trying to do was to be subordinate to nature. And I can give you just a couple examples, and I, I don't know if this group has actually been to Palmetto Bluff yet, but when you get there, there's a four mile ride in that you can come down 95 for a few hours and be wired up and boy, you ride in there and you just exhale. You're really decompressed. And we didn't want to change the character. We didn't want to have any development on that road all the way to the Palmetto Bluff Village. And then secondarily, once you got to the village, we wanted it to be as authentic as possible. Uh, not Disney-esque, but it, you, know, you could say a little bit of it's Disney-esque. But there's, we, we actually took the streetscapes or the street grids of low country towns, Beaufort, South Carolina, McClellanville, South Carolina, which combined the big houses on the corner, the small houses in the middle of the streets, and it created a wonderful streetscape. Now, I'm not going to tell you, we have terrific architecture at Palmetto Bluff, but it's subordinate to the tall pines, it's under the canopy of the live oaks, and none of it impedes the great view out over the May River. Uh, <clears throat> Finally, and this is a topic you could go on for a long time, you know, we created great gathering places, which is a lot of what community building is about. So there are, there are great gathering places, the chapel for weddings, the playgrounds for kids, you know, they're the wonderful fire pits that, you know, can make good friends out of complete strangers in no time. But here you'll see the buildings, and we obviously preserved the ruins of the old Wilson Plantation. There you get the, the scale of what was done, as I said, was subordinate to nature. <clears throat> now, um, 
as far as the real estate at Palmetto Bluff, let me back that one up because I'll come to that. Yeah, you know, we were very successful early on. Uh, in the first five years, uh, we sold a little over 500 lots at an average price of about $560,000. Uh, we nearly, I think one year we grossed about $80 million. And then, like other projects, Palmetto Bluff II hit the Great Recession. But <clears throat> what's really happened, I think, subsequent to the Great Recession has been the validation of Palmetto Bluff from the real estate standpoint. There have been, over the last four or five years, a remarkable number of houses that have been built there. And these are not small houses, these are the big, you know, two, four million dollar structures. And it's just been wonderful to me to see that happen. These are people who, post-recession, have made a decision to be at Palmetto Bluff. Uh, but the problem at Palmetto Bluff, or the, the sort of the weakness, has been the, the operations. And I'll share with you that the model at both Sea Pines and Palmetto Bluff was you really operate a resort to bring qualified buyers to the resort to buy the property. You, if you're in a public scenario, you don't have to advertise the real estate. If you're a gated community, you gotta advertise. But if you're a public resort, travel and leisure, kind of ask, whatever, they'll, br they'll help you bring the people to the resort. So Sea Pines did that. They get you there. You know, there's a sales center in the golf pro shop. The reception center has a sales center. We did the same thing at Palmetto Bluff. Uh, and that was really the design of the inn. But our operating projections on the inn showed that we would be profitable. Uh, we were not gonna make a whole lot of money. That was not the intent. It was to drive real estate sales, but we didn't contemplate losing money. We thought we'd make enough money to refinance out the capital in the resort. But you know, that proved not to be the case. So in the last uh, couple years, Crescent has embarked on a plan really to significantly scale the resort operations at Palmetto Bluff. And I look at it like it's, it's a core resort that was operating in a deficit. You add scale to it and it's basically one plus one equals three. And I'm very optimistic that they're going to succeed at that, but they're you know, they will run into issues of dealing with the conflicts between the resort guests and the property owners. But from <clears throat> my perspective, I really hope that they're going to be able to achieve a very successful operating resort. And most importantly, I hope that this, to get to that scale, that they won't violate, and I don't think they have, the overall concept of subordinate to nature, because that's the great thing to me about Palmetto Bluff and the experience there. Uh, and I frankly, you know, I look forward to going back down there for several years and riding a bike, uh, kayaking with the, uh, the dolphins, having a s'more around the fire pit, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes with some comments, and this is principally directed at the students. Uh, the first, why do you say hire women? Well, let me explain something. <laughs> There's sort of three major decisions in the buy side that have influenced my career. It's either buying a house, renting an apartment, or deciding where to go on a vacation. Women either make that decision or they have veto power over that decision. <laughs> so you can hire a consultant to tell you what women want, or you can hire women. And I strongly recommend hiring women and improving the overall decision making in your company. Second is be a part of the creative development process. You know, a lot of people have made a lot more money in the real estate than I have investing, being brokers, you know, being salespeople, financial engineering, whatever. But for me, you know, the satisfaction and the pride has come from being a part of the creative development process. You know, adding to the, to the built environment and creating a better community. And, you know, I, suffice it to say, I love to take my grandkids to Palmetto Bluff. Next, real estate's capital intensive. Y'all have learned that, but there's a message here for me. And that is, you can spend a lot of time in your career just lining up money. So, as you're looking at this first job, don't be afraid to work 
with a large entity that's got the capital to do stuff. Uh, the more exciting projects for me were all obviously large scale projects, which took a lot of capital, which meant large companies. But that doesn't mean you get lost in those companies because in the case of both Sea Pines and the case of Crescent, we didn't have a corporate staff. All of our projects were executed by small project teams. So don't be afraid to go to work with a big company that's doing exciting things. Figure out how to weasel yourself onto one of those exciting project teams that's doing something fun. <clears throat> the not-for-profit niche. <clears throat> Not-for-profits, believe it or not, essentially all will need help in real estate. So when you get out in your career, join a not-for-profit, you can take it to an extreme. Ron Terwilliger has given his time, talent, $100 million of his money to Habitat for Humanity. He's had an incredible impact. Harry Frampton has led the Vail Valley Foundation had a lot to do with the performing arts facilities that have been built there, major contribution to the cultural and social fabric of the Vale Valley. In my case, it's the YMCA of Greater Charlotte. We've built a number of branches, and as my wife Catherine sitting here in the front will tell you, it's probably the most successful development company that I've ever been involved with. So share your talents with not, the not-for-profit world. Finally, there's uh, what I simply call travel. The mountains of North Carolina, the South Carolina beaches, you know, they're great places for vacation. <clears throat> you, know, you can learn a lot from Google Earth. You can follow Anthony Bourdain. But as far as I'm concerned, you need to travel. You need to see the world. There's a lot to see in the United States, getting out to the edge, seeing our great cities and the Chicago in the Midland with a wonderful architecture. <clears throat> but I would heartily recommend that you go see the great cities of the world. Uh, we just got back from Mexico to see the colonial era residential Spanish communities there. Marvelous adaptive reuse of those places now for retail. Then you got Vienna next with the Ring Circle. Uh, next is Diana Pomar and my wife. And uh, the marvelous city, perhaps the most interesting city in the world, Istanbul. Not sure I'd go there now, but you pick up a real appreciation of the Muslim society. Down here on the bottom right is Copenhagen. Five and a half million people, 11 million bikes. You want to see a community work with bicycles, that's the place to go. Then there's Stockholm. You see how all the, the islands are connected with the wonderful water. Rio. Rio is basically a city in a park, and it's gorgeous. <clears throat> so I would hardly encourage that you do that. And then there's, from a resort standpoint, they're the great natural sites. I mean, we got our own Alaska. There's hella hiking in British Columbia. I should have brought some more pictures. There's a terrific, uh, uh, that's the South Island, New Zealand. And resort people today have built these marvelous new lodging places that do what I call get you out to the edge and experience those places. And last to me would be Patagonia. You can come at it from the Chilean side or the Argentinian side. That's, that may be my favorite. But <clears throat> throw in a natural environment every now and then in the vacation. And then last is what I call a must-see. I think in the balance of my lifetime and in your lifetime, the economic impact and the geopolitical impact of China is only going to increase. So I put China in the must-see category. Go over there, spend a couple of weeks, immerse yourself. There's great things to see, the uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing, the Great Wall. But while you're there, I think it's the largest city in the world now, Shanghai, 24 million people. Right in the middle of it is what they call the Institute for Planning. They've got two scale models. This is a small one. They've got a room much bigger than this, the entire city of Shanghai, they have got a model. Not only is it what it's built, it's what they're projecting to build. It's phenomenal. So take time and go see China. Uh, now, let me just go back over. You know, we covered first Sea Pines Company not being adequately capitalized to get through 
the depression or all, many depression recession of 73 to 75. Then I talked about the metrics of development uh, and the application of what I learned at Sea Pines in the plan community process and how it affected my career. Then we talked about no patents in real estate and finally being subordinate to nature. Uh, I'm open for some questions. I really missed three topics that I probably could have had a separate talk on. One is the country club business and the beloved game of golf. Second is a little more into what happened in 2008 and the impact there and my perspective on that. And then finally, uh, I've been with Faison four years now and it's thrust me into the apartment game, which is something totally different from my previous career in the master plan communities. So with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, as someone coming, I have a strong interest and background in like hospitality, uh, wanting to go into like destination type hotels, which I feel like you were just speaking about. What is your suggestion on like how that's growing? Is that becoming more like destinations or like generic? Uh, Two-fold answer. One, clearly the urban vacation is an emerging trend. I mean, people are now taking vacation in ur urban centers and, you know, we're a part of that process. We really enjoy it. But all that being said, I think it's fascinating to get out and see these places in the, the New Zealands and Patagonia. And there are a couple of them I could tell you about that I think do a remarkable job in pushing their customer to get out and experience nature. Uh, it's, it's, no more, it's just like lifestyle in the community. When you're in these resort destina destination resorts, I think they have to do a great job in making sure that their customer experiences what they have to offer. And like I used to tell the guys at Palmetto Bluff, get the guest out there on the May River, get them to kayak with a dolphin, they'll be back. They want to show their grandkids it. We've got to get them out and experience that kind of thing. So, uh, and those, the larger companies rotate people around in some pretty great locations too. Russ. I'm interested in just a quick comment from you on the role of golf uh, as a primary amenity in future uh, developments. <clears throat> well, it's an imponderable. <laughs> I get, I've given some talks starting in the early 2000s of how we went from the waiting list to get into the golf course to the waiting list to get out. Golf has continued to decline. I had a lot of optimism on all the programs that the PGA and the USGA were using. I've seen a couple programs that still have very active youth programs, but I struggle to see how you can connect future success in a planned community to a golf course. Uh, there, there are just very few under construction. I know of one that they gave the same talk I've heard for 20 years. We're gonna build a great golf course. The family's gonna play. It's gonna be easy to play, but it's gonna be hard enough for the pros to enjoy da 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 da. Tiger Woods designed it, it's failed. Or and I'm sure it's failed, but it clearly has not worked. So I'm, I'm very much a skeptic, although I love the game. Uh, and then I will say as far as you, you've got to take that over to the club side what we didn't see in the clubs is the daily fee revenue started down a lot of courses got built $150 green fee and pretty quickly in 2001 or so they lowered their fees we didn't lower the initiation fees but very shortly we couldn't sell memberships and we had people trying to get out of the clubs and then you got the students here, their age, the millennials take a totally different perspective on joining anything and particularly in joining the country club. So uh, I, I call it an imponderable because I don't know how golf succeeds, but I love the game. You kind of piggybacking on that, what do you, is there an opportunity around the corner of utilizing these courses that may or may not be shutting down or It'd be turning a 27 hole into an 18 or 9 hole. Uh, I don't know if you flipped into that at all. 
Well, I haven't, but yes, I think there is. I think a lot of, I mean, what was it? 180 some courses got taken out of play last year. I mean, they, yes, and, and some of them are in great locations. Um, and I think there's a, another possibility there, and that is to take uh, land and, and parking lots in these successful inner city private clubs today, build the parking deck and go up over it with uh, you know, multifamily housing for the uh, retirees. I think that's a real use you'll see. There are a lot of people now at Hilton Head who were at the beginning of it that are now facing the fact that they're dealing with functional obsolescence and the need for redevelopment, even to the point where they're doing tax increment financing in Hilton Head. And one of the things that they're really concerned about, and they say in retrospect, perhaps condominiums as a concept is problematic for long-term sustainability because of the inability or the more difficult aspect of redeveloping uh, kind of the buildings. Right. And uh, I know there are various state laws that deal with that in the assembly, but what, what can I open head do? Are many islands that have they become dated with respect to buildings that are functionally obsolete? I don't have the answer for that, but I totally agree. And I think you, you, you've got to be really cognizant of that now to do a condominium project. I mean, a lot of people, because we're seeing, you know, 40 and 50 year old vintage projects scraped everywhere and replaced with brand new, similar uses. And I don't know, you've got a lot of the vintage stuff at like Amelia, the oceanfront condos, seven foot ceilings. I mean, they're, they're just not functional anymore. Um, and I know Harry and I've had some, Frampton and I've had conversations about is the whole condo concept viable? Uh, and legally, how do you structure it so that you can take action 30, 40, 50 years down the road to, to adaptively reuse that site? But that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, as someone who's like lived to work through a couple of different real estate cycles, is there any advice you'd like to offer to the current students who are maybe looking to break into the job market um, over the next couple of months? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> First is uh, none of us ever see the downturn coming. I mean, you might perceive some stuff, but it's really after the fact when you really are aware of what's happened to you. And, you know, in my case, the, the 2008 thing, yeah, you know, I saw it coming. I saw Florida starting to slow down well before the Carolinas. But candidly, I didn't know what a uh, subprime mortgage was. And the idea that housing prices to de could decline 35%, I said, there's no way. I mean, our housing stock's just not gonna decline. Uh, those loans can't get in trouble. That, you know, the average probably a 10% down payment, 90% loan to value. But, you know, it happened. I think that what my advice would be is to get ahead really do some research and find, my term for it is try to figure out a place to play where others don't play. Uh, that's much easier said than done. If you look back, Sea Pines was really playing up here in the market. Uh, at Crescent, throughout the mid 90s to the mid 2000s, if you were buying a house over half a million dollars in Charlotte, there's a 50% chance you're buying in a Crescent community. That's playing where no, essentially nobody else plays. We had a dominant market position. So if I'm a student today, I think I really want to look and find where a competitive advantage is where others don't play. You know, I, I got some, I mean, it's hard to say that the urban infill stuff isn't the place to be. Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to find your own corner and protect yourself. Uh, you know, people keep coming up with differentiators where they have a competitive advantage. You know, it can be simply price, but you know, it used to be, I remember when people started putting granite countertops in our single family houses. Now you can't build one without a granite or maybe one of them. But the point is find a place or really search for somebody who's got a competitive advantage and seek where to play, whereas I say nobody else plays. I, I will give you a, 
my one tidbit, and I, I don't know who's going to answer or who's going to respond to this, but <clears throat> my age group, you know, we've all got these elderly parents, and they're in these assisted living, senior living places, and we go there and visit our parents. And the boomers had transformational power through all of the real estate products in our, in our life. And we don't want to and ain't going to live in the places that we see our parents in. So I'd really challenge you, go out and figure out how to make a creative place that's got a, a wonderful environment that you know, 10 years from now an 80 year old boomer like me can, can really enjoy living in. Because I don't want to live in the places that are out there right now. That's a great one to close on. Tom, thank you very yep. much. Tom, we have gifts for you. They're outside and we'll get those for you in just a second. Uh, great lessons, not only for the students, but for all of us. So thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to reopen the uh, reception area again. There's plenty of food, and uh, we've got another half an hour or so while it's going to be open. But thank you, and uh, please talk to Thomas, your wife, Catherine, later when you have a chance. Thank you.